طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي In the name of Allah, the Lord of mercy, the giver of mercy and prayers and blessings be on his beloved Prophet Muhammad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi The companion that I get to talk about today, alhamdulillah, is a woman by the name of Lubaba bint al-Hadith radiallahu anha. So I'm just going to like talk about her name for a second. So Lub is, is that the, the essence or the core of something. And I remember as a child, anytime my mom would, I would be doing something and my mom wants me to stop, she'd shoot me this look. And she would quote this line to me, and it says, Certainly the person with intellect, with lub, with a core that is grounded, can understand from just a sign. And I knew that that meant that I was going to stop doing whatever I was doing. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> it's funny, my brother at some point called, and he's like, you know how mama would like just look at us and you just stop? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I stared at my son. He stared right back. I don't think I'm doing it right, man. And I'm like, no, dude, I don't think you're doing it right. Like, do we, what do we do? Like, practice in the mirror? Like, try to figure out how to do it just right? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. May Allah reward my mom, alhamdulillah, and everyone's mom. Alhamdulillah. So Lubaba bint al-Hadith, her, her kunya was Umm al-Fadl. And this is not something that we really do right now, but it's like you're... I don't want to say your stage name because it wasn't a stage, but it was, this is what she was known for. And it was because her eldest son was named Al-Fadl, and she was known as Umm Al-Fadl, the mother of Al-Fadl. But in the Arabic language, when you would call someone Umm something or Abu something, you're actually also attributing more to them than that. And she is so deserving of this. So Fadl is, is more than just, it's a form of excellence. Like when we say Fadlullah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Fadl on us. It's not like your needs are met. It's your needs are met and then so much more. It's someone that is so generous, giving from such an endless bounty. That's what fadl means. It's one of the higher, highest levels of excellence, subhanAllah. And her eldest son was named al-fadl, and so she was known as umm al-fadl, the mother of al-fadl. Also, she was umm al-fadl not just as, as a mother to her son, but also in terms of her character, radiallahu anha. So the first thing I want you to know about her is that she was Khadija radiallahu anha's best friend. Which, I mean, subhanAllah, the Prophet sallallahu says, Mbada ala dini khalila. The person is with a, with, you, you have the same religion as your khalil. And the word khalil, it actually has the same word, word as khilla, as deficiency. That when this person's missing, you feel like something's wrong. Right? You know how you, like, you do something, you're like, who am I going to call? And then the first person you call. So she was Khadija radiallahu anha's best friend. And what an incredible best friend. So based on her narration, she said, I took my shahada the same day as Khadija radiallahu anha. Who was, who was the first person to become Muslim? Khadija radiallahu anha. That's completely agreed upon. There is zero dispute over who the first Muslim was. It was Khadija radiallahu anha. And she's saying, I took my shahada first, same day as my friend Khadija radiallahu anha. So by all accounts, she is the second woman to become Muslim. And then we don't know, was there any of the men that became Muslim before her or not? We don't actually know. So she could have been the second Muslim outside of the family of the Prophet ﷺ, of course, just period. When we say the first and the second, we don't meet like, of course, his daughter Fatima radiallahu anha, his daughter Ruqayya, Zainab, and Umm Kuthum radiallahu anha, the, the people in the household of the Prophet ﷺ. Subhanallah. But outside of the house of the Prophet Sallallahu she was the second woman to ever become, she was, became Muslim after her friend Khadija radiallahu anha. Her husband, Abbas radiallahu anha, was the Prophet Sallallahu uncle. He was three years older than the Prophet Sallallahu and if those are your family friends. You know how you get married and you have couple friends? <laughs> These were their couple friends. <laughs> they had kids that were of similar age, they were just, subhanAllah, really, really, really close friends. My, one of my closest friends, she used to live right next door to me. We used to drink coffee together every morning. Like, we were friends' friends. And some of the narrations about her, the Prophet Sallallahu used to go visit her and used to take naps at her house. That's how close they were. Like, my friend, I go drink coffee at her house. I'm like, oh, I have to do this. I'm just going to sit on your couch. I'm going to take a nap for like 20 minutes and I'm going to get up. I live next door. Like, I don't need to nap on her couch. <laughs> But I felt comfortable enough napping on her couch, subhanAllah. And you can imagine the Prophet ﷺ doing this in the house of Umm al-Fadl radiallahu anha. In the house of his uncle Abbas radiallahu anha, who was only actually only three years older than him. 
Al-Abbas was tasked with As-Siqaya wal imara al-Hujjaj. So when people would come to Mecca from all these different places intending to visit the Kaaba, Al-Abbas was actually responsible for giving them water. And they would give them water from the well of Zamzam. Where, does anyone know where we got the word Zamzam? Yes, someone said yes. Who came up with the name? Hajar alayhi salam. So we know the story of how she was making du'a and she was going back and forth between the Safa and the Marwa. She's making all this du'a and she's working really hard and every time someone goes to Hajar Umrah they follow in the footsteps of our mother Hajar alayhi salam. I'm not saying this just because I'm Egyptian but she is from the land of the Nile. Allah <laughs> our mother Hajar alayhi salam. But the reason that's significant is when the water started gushing out and people started, she tried to collect it and she kept saying, zummi, zummi, collect, collect. This is where we got the word, zamzam. And the other tribes came in and they said, we want a portion of the water. She says, yes, but I manage it. Because none of you know how to manage a water resource. I'm from the land of the Nile. I know how to manage a water resource. And when we think of Lubaba radiallahu she is the inheritor of our mother Hajar alayhi salam. She's best friends with Khadija radiallahu anha, but also in this role, an inheritor of our foremother. SubhanAllah. So something that's, I just wanted, wanted to stop for a second just talking about Mecca. Mecca was the city of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and Ibrahim alayhi wa Neither one of them is actually buried in Mecca. Ibrahim alayhi wa is buried in Khalil in Palestine, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is buried in Medina. The two people that are actually buried in Mecca that are holding down the fort are actually our mothers, Hajar alayhi salam and Khadija radiallahu anha. So the amount of loyalty that Lubaba radiallahu anha had to her friend Khadija was so incredible. And every time I think of her, I think of Baraka radiallahu anha, who inshallah Dr. Rania will talk about next. She was friends with Amina and continued on being a mother to the Prophet sallallahu long after Amina radiallahu anha passed. And Lubaba radiallahu anha, if you can imagine the role Khadija radiallahu anha had. After her friend passed away, that was the role that she took on to honor her friend Khadija radiallahu anha being a mother to the ummah. We think of the Prophet sallallahu as the father to the ummah and ummahat al the mothers of the believers, are the mothers of the ummah. And they carried us through after the passing of the Prophet sallallahu When you lose a parent, you rely on the other. We relied on the mothers of the believers radiallahu anhunna. And Lubaba radiallahu anha has served a similar role to her, her best friend Khadija radiallahu anha. So I just, subhanAllah. Um, sorry, Sister um, Ustadha Maryam, Afwan. Ustadha Maryam had mentioned this where she was talking about some of her in laws. And there is a narration, Wallahu alam, it's not a strong narration, but it's still a narration where the Prophet sallam, says, Al Akhawat al Mu'minat, the believing sisters. And he lists them. He says, Maymuna, Zawjat al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Maymuna, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Her sister Umm al Fadl, so Maymuna and Umm al Fadl actually shared both parents. And then the other two sisters, Asma and Salma, the wife of, uh, um, excuse me, Asma bint Umais, radiallahu anha, who Maryam had just spoke about, and her sister, Salma bint Umais, who were actually, um, they shared a, a mother, but didn't share a father with Umm al Fadl, Lubaba radiallahu anha. So they were half sisters. SubhanAllah. I just want to add that it doesn't actually end there. Because they had an, she had another half-sister, Zainab radiallahu anha, who actually married the Prophet sallallahu in the third year of the Hijrah and passed away within a few months. Zainab bint Khuzayma radiallahu anha. So she has two sisters who married the Prophet sallallahu a half-sister and a full sister, subhanAllah. Um, the other person, she also had a younger sister named Lubaba radiallahu Lubaba Sughra, so they, they loved the name so much, they said Lubaba the older and Lubaba the younger. Lubaba the younger was actually the mother of Khan Walid radiallahu anha. And you're seeing, you're hearing all these family connections. SubhanAllah. Those four sisters are actually part of what bound all of these leaders of Mecca together. If you think of sisterhood, we should be thinking of these four women. SubhanAllah. And part of what's fascinating about sisterhood is that women, in general, the way that women lead is very different from how men lead. For the men to lead, you have to have one person standing at the front and it's clear this is the person leading. With women, the leader actually stands in the middle. I remember the first time I had to lead Salah and I was so scared. My friend's like, I'm going to support you. I'm like, how are you going to support me? Like, either you're leading or I'm leading. And she's like, I'll stand next to you. And I'm like, okay, that's, that is true. In Egyptian, she says, Ha'af Gambik, which also means like, I'll support you. But I'm like, it literally means I'm just going to stand next to you. And I'm like, well, cool. I'm doing that. She did stand next to me. It was very helpful. 
Because this is how women lead, subhanAllah. And they're raising this generation of people together. So Lubaba radiallahu anha became Muslim all the way at the beginning. And we know from the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu there were three years that they were doing da'wah, the Prophet sallallahu was doing da'wah in secret. And she is someone that had to keep that secret for a long time. Her husband Abbas did not become Muslim until years later. SubhanAllah. He was actually one of the only two of the uncles of the Prophet Sallallahu who became Muslim, Hamza and Abbas anhu. SubhanAllah. And SubhanAllah that these two sisters were married to those brothers. SubhanAllah. So Lubaba radiallahu anhu becomes Muslim within the first year of the of the ba'th of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam within the first year of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam receiving revelation. And then three years in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam receives a command from the from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it says, Wa ashiratak al aqrabin and warn your closest family. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam hosts a family gathering at his house. He invites all of them over and they all have this huge meal and right as he is about to talk, mind you the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has spoken to his family members before. They know what he's talking about. And there's one person in particular, one of his uncles, Abu Lahab, who before this point had been very supportive of the Prophet ﷺ. He loved the Prophet ﷺ. He's actually the one who paid for his aqiqah. You know when the child is born and someone donates the animal and has the dinner and all. Like Abu Lahab actually did that. And initially when the Prophet ﷺ told him about Islam, he actually is like, yeah, this is a cool thing. And then he looked and in an enslaved man, he said, me and him will be equal. I don't want what you're selling. Imagine how hurtful that is. It was really, it was literally his arrogance that got him. May Allah protect us from arrogance. And may Allah protect us from ever looking at another human being and saying, I'm better than them. Because that destroyed Abu Lahab. The Prophet ﷺ invites everyone over. Before he can get a word out, Abu Lahab stands up. He says, if we don't stop him, all of the Arabs are going to fight us. And he ruins the Prophet ﷺ's dinner. The Prophet ﷺ lets them all go home. He calls another dinner. Lubaba radiallahu anha is there. Al-Abbas radiallahu anha is there. She's part of the family. She's probably helping her friend Khadija radiallahu anha. She's her best friend. Every time my best friend hosted a huge dinner, I was there cooking with her. This is what your friends do. They had another one. Everyone comes over. Before they finish the meal, to preempt Abu Lahab, the Prophet ﷺ starts calling to his family. He tells them, if I'm going to lie to anyone, I wouldn't lie to you. You're my people. You're my family. And subhanAllah, al-Abbas, he turned away. He didn't assault the Prophet ﷺ, but he wasn't ready. And we know this famous moment where Ali radiallahu he says, I, I, I'm going to do it. He was 10 years old. <sighs> subhanAllah, we talked about Asma radiallahu anhu converting when she was 11. How many, how many people, young people in our community be like, oh, what do they know? Oh, what did Ali radiallahu anhu know? Again, don't be the person that dismisses Ali radiallahu anhu. May Allah protect us from ever being that. But she's there. She's a witness to all of these things. Finally, the Prophet sallallahu stands on the mountain of Safa. He calls out to everyone. And again, Abu Lahab is the one who insults the Prophet sallallahu And subhanAllah, he said, he told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa May you be cursed the rest of the day. And the Quran was revealed, said, Tabbat yada Abi Lahab wa tab. May the hands of Abu Lahab become cursed, subhanAllah. May Allah protect us from that. Which, I mean, you insult the Prophet ﷺ. It's a short surah, so like five-year-olds in the Ummah are learning it till the Day of Judgment. <laughs> do not mess with the Prophet. <laughs> like, don't ever do that, subhanAllah. But she's a witness to all of these things, and all of these things are happening in front of her eyes. There are people that have left. SubhanAllah, there was a moment where we know when the Prophet ﷺ was a young child, when after the passing of his mother and the passing of his grandfather, the Prophet, his grandfather asked his uncle Abdul Muttalib to take care of him. And he in fact lived in the house of Abdul Muttalib. And then at some point Abdul Muttalib became so overwhelmed, he had 10 children, he couldn't support all of his children. So Al Abbas and the Prophet said, let's take some of his children and take care of all of their needs and all of their finances. And that's actually how Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anh, ended up in the house of the Prophet. Ja'far radiallahu anh, who we talked about, who was the white, the, who was married to his wife is Asma radiallahu anh, who uh, Ustaz Maryam talked about, he grew up in the house of Al-Abbas, where Lubaba was a mother to him. He wasn't her biological child, but she raised him in her own house. And we know that Ja'far radiallahu anh was the closest person to the Prophet sallallahu in looks and in character, subhanAllah. This was the Prophet sallallahu telling him this. 
by the seven, sixth year since the beginning of the revelation, now at this point, the Prophet Sallallahu and his words, the Quran, the, 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 the Quran that he was reciting and the truth that he was giving people became so powerful, they decided they're going to boycott them. And mind you, when they're boycotting them, they're not boycotting the Muslims. The majority of the Muslims, some of the Muslims ran away to, uh, to Abyssinia, in modern day Ethiopia, some of the Muslims, which subhanAllah, Najashi is the first king to ever become Muslim. SubhanAllah. Some of them are hiding their Islam. They can't go anywhere. And then the entire family of the Prophet ﷺ gets forced in the place called Sha'ab Bani Talib. And they were between, like, between the mountains. No one was allowed to trade with them. And the majority of them, I want to point out, were not Muslim. They were standing on principle. They were not actually Muslim. And you can imagine the guilt the Prophet ﷺ is feeling. His entire family is getting pushed out. Can you, like, his uncle made him sleep in a different place every night out of fear that someone would betray him and sell him out from hunger. In the midst of all of this, Lubaba is witnessing her best friend Khadija Radhi get weaker and weaker. And subhanAllah, everyone's really struggling. And it was actually then that Allah gifted her her son Abdullah ibn Abbas can you imagine being the person that is bringing this joyous news to the Prophet ﷺ? And I want to point out that her son Abdullah ibn Abbas, they call him Hibr Hadi al Ummah. He's, he is the scholar of the Ummah. Which, I mean, <laughs> wow, he's the scholar of the Ummah. She made dua that Allah gift him knowledge. And he was the one that carried on the legacy of so much of the family of the Prophet. ﷺ. He carried on the legacy of hadith. There's so many stories about him that when the, uh, he would like the Sahaba, the elder Sahaba, they said, they, they, he said, he realized, he told his friends, he's like, the Sahaba are starting to pass away. I need to go ask them stuff. So he goes sleep in front of their house. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhu, he'd open his door in the morning, he'd find Abdullah ibn Abbas like sleeping in front of his door. <laughs> SubhanAllah. That was her son. And this is the moment where he was born. Giving hope to the ummah. And when he was born, we talked about this idea of tahniq where you, you, you take the date. They didn't have a date. The Prophet ﷺ took his saliva and he put it inside of the mouth of Abdullah ibn Abbas عن, this newborn child, the son of Lubaba radiallahu anha. SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah, the, 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 the boycott is lifted. The next year is actually called the year of sorrow. Because Khadija radiallahu anha passes away. And the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ who was protecting him passes away. So two things happened. The protection of the Prophet ﷺ moved on to Al-Abbas, to his other uncle. So again, even though he was not Muslim, he was protecting the Prophet ﷺ. And can you imagine what Lubaba took from her friend Khadija? To continue protecting, she was known when you are stuck in Mecca and you can't get out and you're Muslim and you need help, that Lubaba radiallahu is the person that you go to. And everyone knew this. This is what she was known for, out of loyalty to her friend Khadija radiallahu anha. SubhanAllah. When the time of the Hijrah comes, she's Muslim. She can't leave. Her husband's not Muslim. Her Islam is a secret. And even Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anha, he said, my mother and I for were from those who were oppressed in Mecca that couldn't leave. But she was given a task by the Prophet ﷺ to protect everyone else that was stuck in Mecca that also couldn't leave. And she did this with loyalty for years. And it's one thing to be like, mashallah, we talked about the people that went to Abyssinia. They were the people of the two Hijrah. Lubaba radiallahu was stuck in Mecca, in the center of it all, watching them raise an army against the Prophet ﷺ. During the Battle of Badr, her, uh, her husband, Abbas, was actually forced into the battle against the Muslims. And she's watching him go to join an army to fight the, the Prophet ﷺ. Like, imagine what she is going through as she's witnessing this. SubhanAllah, the Muslims, we know the Muslims won in Badr. The Meccans had never imagined that. They were undefeated. Badr was such, like, blew everybody's minds. People could not fathom, like, actually, subhanAllah, the Qur'an calls it Yawm al -Fuqad. It is the day where, where, where truth has become evident, subhanAllah, in the Battle of Badr. So the Battle of Badr happens. The disbelievers are running back to Mecca. And there's one, only one leader of Mecca that didn't leave with them. He was a coward, and his name is... We talked about him already. Who's the coward that didn't go? Abu Lahab. 
You paid someone else to go on his behalf. He's like, you owe me a debt? Go, <laughs> go to this battle. I don't want to go. So he's the only leader of Mecca that didn't go. And, the, and subhanAllah, the, the, the Muslims win such a resounding victory that now there are people that are just running, trickling back into Mecca. It's not a celebratory army that's coming back with a parade or anything. Like People are just running back into Mecca. So they run back into Mecca, and everyone's saying, we lost, we lost. Quraysh is like, wait, what? What are you talking about? And more and more people kept coming in until finally a man came in and, and Abu Lahab held him. He's like, tell me what happened. And he started describing the battle to him. He told him there were these men that were wearing all white. They were on horses that were between the heavens and the earth. He's describing the angels. And he said they would strike someone and, and the wound wouldn't be red, it would be green. And subhanAllah, there was a... There was a um, a mawla, an enslaved man that was living in her house, who was also Muslim. And his Islam was a secret. He started, he couldn't contain himself. He's like, the angels, the angels. Abu Lahab was furious. He took this man, he started to beat him. Like, even the narration said he was literally on top of him, hitting him. And I want you to picture this, because who has power in that moment? Abu Lahab does. Who has the clout and the authority in that moment? Abu Lahab does. And I don't mean to, like, in America, we all know this. If you see an officer standing over a man, beating him, who has the power in that moment? How terrifying is it to stand up to that person who clearly has no problem? using all of their power and all of their authority to physically harm someone. Luaba radiallahu picked up one of the poles of the tent, which I can't even imagine, like for the adrenaline that she must be going through her body and the physical strength that she had, she went and she whacked Abu Lahab on the head. That was the only way to get him off. You know when someone's crazed and won't let go? She knew it, and she whacked him. Yeah, oh, she is a boss lady. And she told Abu Lahab, you think because Al-Abbas is not here that you can do this to a member of our household? I want you to also understand, in that position, she's also a member of Al-Abbas's household. Clearly, Abu Lahab had no problem beating anyone in the house of Al-Abbas. And she took that stand anyway. It's one thing when it's, subhanAllah, because now we watch all these videos. You, unfortunately, there's some horrendous videos that you witness. And there are other wi videos where you see another cop that stood up to a, a cop and said, hey, we're not doing this. This was another person that stood up and said, I'm just as vulnerable as him, and I'm going to stand up for him anyway. Within seven days, Abu Lahab had passed away. Not from that hit, but actually from an infection that he got from it. So even though Lubaba was not part of the Battle of Badr, the remaining leader of Mecca that was fighting the Prophet ﷺ, she's actually the one that got him. And she got him defending another person, subhanAllah. Someone that Mecca had decided was, was vulnerable enough and not worth fighting for, subhanAllah. She stood up and fought them. SubhanAllah. By the third year of the Hijrah, that's the point where her, her half-sister Zainab bint Khuzayma married the Prophet ﷺ after her husband was martyred, and within a few months she passed away. By the fifth year of the Hijrah, all this she's stuck in Mecca. Everybody's like, all this stuff is happening now, Sulh al they're coming, they're doing, they're, they're, they're creating this treaty with the Prophet ﷺ. They were coming to do Umrah, they get sent back from their Umrah, they sign the treaty. By the sixth year of the Hijrah, they're doing something called Umrah al-Qada, where the year after they came back to do their Umrah. During that Umrah, everyone in Mecca emptied out because they didn't even want to witness the Prophet ﷺ coming in all of his glory. They actually start, sorry, I don't know how much time we have. Okay, alhamdulillah. They started this rumor about the Muslims. They're like, oh, they've gotten diseased and now they're sick in Medina and they're not okay. Do you, has anyone, how many people have been to Umrah? Few people. You know that part in the Sa'i where there's like the, the green lights and people run faster? That was the only part that the disbelievers could see the, the, the Muslims doing their Sa'i. So the Prophet ﷺ told them, in this portion, I need you to run faster and that's why we run faster of like, oh, you're calling us sick, we're doing our sa'i, and we're running in the sa'i. And they're like, man, <laughs> really strong. SubhanAllah. But the Lubaba and, and Abbas, عنه, 
they were still living in Mecca, and her sister Maymuna was actually living in her house until the Prophet ﷺ came and proposed to her, and that's actually where the wedding happened. It happened in those three days in Mecca. And Abbas and Lubaba um, were actually the ones who hosted this wedding, where she is her full sister Maymuna is marrying the Prophet ﷺ, and she was the last woman to actually marry the Prophet ﷺ. She was the last of the mothers of the believers, subhanAllah. In the eighth year of the Hijrah, that's how long it took. Finally, Alhamdulillah, Al Abbas became Muslim. He became Muslim, he took his shahada, he decided to do Hijrah. He is actually counted as the very last Muhajir. Because for you to be a Muhajir, you have to, you have to take your shahada and go towards the Prophet ﷺ before the conquest of Mecca. He leaves Mecca with the intention of joining the Prophet ﷺ, and lo and behold, the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba are all just outside of Mecca, now coming for the conquest of Mecca. SubhanAllah. So the Prophet ﷺ comes in, they conquer Mecca, and the Prophet ﷺ, there's so many moments, like it wasn't just her, it was her and a few other people, that the Prophet ﷺ, Aisha radiallahu asked him, she's like, you sat with these people for a long time, who are they? Like there's some important dignitaries, it's this or it's that. He says, we're remembering the good old days of Khadija. He's coming home to his house where Khadija radiallahu was buried. This is now a decade later, this was her friend. And the Prophet ﷺ is just excited to see her. SubhanAllah, after that moment, she actually, her and Abbas and their whole family actually joins the Prophet ﷺ in Medina. And he was in those last two years of them, of the life of the Prophet ﷺ when they're living in Medina that we now get all of the narrations about her and her attractions with the Prophet ﷺ. She narrates, and she narrates actually a few hadith from him. And her son Abdullah ibn Abbas, who is known as the narrator of hadith, he actually narrates from his mother, Lubaba, um al -fadl. There are two narrations, one of them that I think is hilarious. So when al Hussein, an, the grandson of the Prophet, ﷺ, was born, Lubaba actually nursed him. So she was a nurse mom to al Hussein. An. And she was carrying the baby, and she goes to the visit the Prophet ﷺ. She hands the Hussein radiallahu anhu to the Prophet ﷺ, and this is just funny because it's I don't know human. And then Hussein radiallahu anhu pees all over the Prophet ﷺ. <laughs> I mean, they're just normal human everyday things. Babies do this. She tells the Prophet ﷺ, you know, if you go change, I can I can wash it for you. And this is actually where we get the fiqh ruling where the Prophet ﷺ says, for a newborn boy, you can actually just sprinkle water on it. It doesn't ruin your tahara. But for, for if it's a newborn girl, then you actually have to wash the garment. And there's, yeah, I'm not going to get into the fiqh of that because it's too long. Alhamdulillah. But I just think it's really fascinating. SubhanAllah. Again, it's everyday things. The, the reason we know how to make ghusl is because her sister Maymun is the one that told us. Like, who else is going to watch the Prophet and make ghusl? <laughs> it had to be his wife. <laughs> the narration was from Maymun. That's how we know how to make ghusl. This is the, the value of these women, subhanAllah. She went with the Prophet ﷺ during Hajj al-Wada. And during, during the Hajj, there were people that were having a discussion. They're like, is the Prophet ﷺ fasting? It's the day of Arafah. Is he fasting? Is he not fasting? What do we do? And she knew he wasn't fasting. But she did something that was very subtle and very smart. She just took some milk, went to the Prophet ﷺ, handed him the bowl. He stopped, he drank the milk in front of everyone, and everyone was like, okay, not fasting. That's how we know that ruling. And the reason I mention how she did it is in that subtlety, we might miss that it was a woman's wisdom that gave us this ruling. No one, when you read the fiqh of Adnan Lubaba anha, is the reason, we don't know, like, she's not necessarily listed in those books, but we know it was her wisdom that did this. Just because we don't know the stories and the women and our mothers and our foremothers that came before us doesn't mean that Allah did not see them. I remember going to my, my teacher, Allah, Arhamu Sheikh Ayyub, and I would get so frustrated about things. He's like, why do you care? Allah knows. I'm like, oh, but Sheikh, someone's taking credit for blah, 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 and I would get so mad. And he's like, why do you care? Allah knows. I need Allah to know. I don't need everybody else to know. I just think it's so beautiful, subhanAllah. There's another, um, how much time do I have? Okay, all right, alhamdulillah. There was one of my favorite narrations from the time where the Prophet, because part of this is Lubaba radiallahu besides making dua for her son Abdullah ibn Abbas, is she's now taking him to actually have access to the Prophet sallallahu And this is the hadith that I teach my, well, if you're, if you're on campus, welcome halaqa on Thursday is this hadith, heads up. 
But Abbas Allah, he's saying one of the days where I was riding with the Prophet Sallallahu they're famous. Like, can you imagine? Like, and then we were driving, and I was riding shotgun, and the Prophet Sallallahu was driving. You know, you know, as you do, it's just riding with the Prophet Sallallahu And the Prophet Sallallahu looks at him. He says, "Ya, ya ghulam, O oh young man, in you alimuka kalimat. I'm going to teach you these words." He's telling him, like, watch attention, pay attention, watch this. This is important. Listen up. And he tells him, "Ihfadillah, yahfadak. Be mindful of Allah. Allah will be mindful of you. Ihfadillah, tajidhu tajahak." Be mindful of Allah and Allah will be facing you. Allah will like personally be taking care of you. If you ask, ask Allah. If you rely, rely on Allah. And know that if the whole ummah got together with something to benefit you, with something they can't benefit you with something except that Allah has already pre-written for you. And if they all get together to harm you with something, they can't harm you with something except that Allah has already written for you. The pens have been lifted and the ink has dried. SubhanAllah. Her being in Medina means that we have this hadith so her son can learn it from the Prophet ﷺ. Her son was actually an advisor to Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anh. He was 13 years old when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Again, we can't dismiss the young people. SubhanAllah. Oh, so much. Okay, way too much. I'm just going to try to wrap up. Lubaba radiallahu anh had passed away during the time of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anh continue to be a support for different people in the Ummah I just wanted to stop in for a second and point out that her son Abdullah ibn Abbas was known for his knowledge in the Ummah her nephew Khalil ibn Walid was known for his military might and in one of the narrations from the narration from, I don't know what's happening with the microphones oh. well we should have done that a long time ago <laughs> Sufyan ibn Ayyina in one of the narrations says that the, the women of um, Hilal, al-Hilal, because she's al hilaliyah from Bani Hilal, they mothered so many of these leaders of Mecca. Some of them had political power, some of them had military power, some of them had knowledge, which in and of itself is power. And she's the mother of the one that actually had the knowledge. And I want to, like, subhanAllah, this is a form of power. We don't realize the power that knowledge gives us. It can make every, like an entire, like our communities are made of people. If we change our behaviors and all become different, the, the, the ayah says, Allah doesn't change what is with the people until they change what is within themselves. We look at these huge systems. How are we supposed to end systemic racism? A well, system was made by people. We'll change the people and we'll change the system. SubhanAllah. That's how the system has actually become changed. I don't know if that was a cheer, but woohoo, alhamdulillah. Oh Allah. <laughs> okay, wait, I'm not done yet. <laughs> Last thing. I just want to say that community building in and of itself is a form of knowledge. And this is the knowledge that Lubaba radiallahu anha, the one who is known for her wisdom, the one whose name actually means the core and the essence, the qalb. This is what her name means. That is the wisdom that she, she possessed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted her. Community building is a form of knowledge. It's a form of scholarship. When we talk about scholarship, a lot of the times we think, who can quote all the different madhahab and this and that and knows all the dala'al. That is a form of scholarship. Community building is also a form of scholarship. And I say this because sometimes you walk into, you go into different Muslim spaces and a lot of the times it's unthanked women that are the ones that are actually building the community, that are calling, who's, who's in trouble, let me call her, who needs this, let's figure out, let's, what's happening? It's usually the women. I want us to know that that in and of itself is a form of knowledge, it's a form of ilm and it's a form of scholarship. And that was the scholarship of our mother Lubaba radiallahu anha. Allahu Akbar, subhanAllah, she inherited it from her friend Khadija radiallahu anha to be the mother of the ummah, one of the mothers of the ummah, whether she birthed that child or not, subhanAllah. May Allah accept from us all, and may Allah allow us to live along the footsteps of Sayyidah Lubaba radiallahu anha.